Okay, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Owen Miller and I am a lecturer here at SOAS in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, I wouldn't describe myself particularly as a North Korea specialist, but I have found myself as part of a Korean Studies Lab project, uh, which uh, Professor Andre Langkov is going to tell you something about in a moment. And that lab project is about North Korea and it has the title which you see on the screen here. So this symposium today really is to sort of showcase some of the work that's being done uh, in this um, lab project funded by the Academy of Korean Studies. And also we have brought in other people. We have brought in some uh, PhD students who are working on North Korean history and North Korean international relations in the UK. And we're very lucky also to have um, some scholars who work outside of North Korea and Korean studies who work on um, uh, Russia and Eastern Europe, who are here to uh, give us some, some very valuable insights, I think, as well. Um, so I'd just like to also welcome you on behalf of the Center of Korean Studies here at SOAS, which is hosting this event. Um, and uh, our chair is not here today, Dr. Anders Carlson, so I will welcome you on his behalf. Um, <clears throat> what can I say about Center of Korean Studies? It's uh, uh, one of the older, if not the oldest, Center for Korean Studies in the UK. I'll probably get told I'm completely wrong about that, but anyway, <laughs> it was founded in 1987 with, of course, support from uh, South Korean uh, organizations such as the Korea Foundation. And it's been going since then, and we hold regular seminars on a Friday evening. So if you want to know about those, um, our, our uh, center's officer, Charles, who is here, can take people's emails, or you can email him directly and get onto our mailing list. Um, and of course, we also organize events such as this one, one-off events and small conferences and so on. So yeah, please, um, you know, if you haven't been to Center of Korean Studies events before, please uh, have a look at what we're doing and, and come in uh, in the future. Uh, in terms of today, uh, I think people have probably looked at the program. Um, <clears throat> I'll just quickly put it up here. Uh, uh, it's, um, as you can see, we have quite a long session this morning. I'm hoping that we can have short fi five minute break in between uh, speakers. We are being generous and allowing each presenter to have an hour of time, you know, to give their presentation and for the discussant to respond and for uh, questions and comments from the audience. So therefore we have a more or less three hour session in the morning, but we will, um, hope, as I said, hopefully be able to have a breather in between um, uh, speakers. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I need to say. Oh, well, there, there is tea and coffee, as you've already discovered. There will be tea and coffee again in the afternoon. Um, there is also going to be a buffet lunch outside. Uh, there will be, um, it's really first come, first serve. That's not an invitation to go and uh, attack each other to get at the food. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it is, uh, you know, a reminder that um, scarcity is real. And um, Okay, that's, yeah, that's about all I have to say, really. Uh, but yes, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor Lankov, who's going to say something about... Uh, sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> there are exits. Please use them in the case of an emergency. <laughs> well, I should say, unfortunately, you know, SOAS uh, um, always seems to have fire alarms at the most inopportune moment. So please do expect one in the middle of someone's talk. <laughs> um, oh, now I need to improvise while Professor Lankov is on the... Uh, <clears throat> Maybe a, a little rap or <laughs> 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 to open the floor for questions. No, yeah. Uh, so, um, basically, everybody or pretty much everybody here is interested in North Korea, and you know that North Korea has not only bad press worldwide, it has a strange press, it's seen as a kind of a joke. Uh, something irrational or something comical. 
made. Well, maybe sometimes it's irrational and comical, but can you find me a country which is 100% rational and 100% co not comical? <laughs> it's quite irrational. I will not talk about some peculiarities of the British political system. <laughs> yeah, having said that, uh, so what, what's important, however, to stop exoticizing North Korea, to have a serious look at, at the country. Maybe very unpleasant place. Personally, I would never like to live there. Well, unless I'm an expert. Uh, but uh, yes, place with a great deal of its own pro problems, but still a place where, after all, 20-something million people live, where over the last 75 five years, maybe about 100 million people have lived their lives. And it was not a life of a kind of uh, clones or irrational human beings. It wasn't the life of normal human beings overwhelmingly. And it's very good that we occasionally, at least more and more frequently, have opportunities to do serious research on North Korea. It's past, it's present, and to a small extent, to its definitely unpredictable future. And this is a, a task of our laboratory, which is, fortunately, we would like to express our gratitude, is supported by the Korean, Korean taxpayers and their loyal servants, the Academy of Korean Studies. Uh, so, and our result, we have a group of roughly 10 people, and our goal, our goal is to produce a uh, roughly equal number of book length academic studies of different things related to North Korea. It can be market economy, political system, foreign policy, popular culture, and so on, and so on, and so on. And not only books, of course, the academic articles, and we also have some series of seminars and two conferences, two short conferences, one of he, one of which you uh, attending, for which I would like to express my gratitude, and we will try to we'll, we'll do our best to make sure that everything will be interesting for you, that you are not going to be disappointed for being here. And we'll have another conference in June uh, in Korea. So those who are hap will happen to be in Korea, you're also, also most welcome. No. Thank you. Yes, South Korea. I think that I, I, I think that conference in North Korea is not going to happen for the next fifty years. But you never know. Yeah. So, thank you. Right. I should I should add that I'll be chairing the first uh, session, and um, that we're our first two speakers, um, Tatiana Kabrusenko from uh, uh, Korea University, and um, Xiaoning Lu, who is my colleague here at SOAS in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures, who will be the discussant. Um, they are both joining us on uh, Zoom. So our first, just our first uh, speaker and discussant will be on Zoom. And then after that, it will be live people in the room. <laughs> so. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I am, uh, I'm going to present today on uh, changes which North Korean culture uh, underwent in 1980s, and uh, I would just first to start with an apology, uh, because uh, my understanding was that um, I will have only 15 minutes for presentation, but I see you are twice as generous <laughs> to <laughs> us, so uh, it means that I had to rework a little bit my presentation to extend it, because I tried to, uh, when I presented uh, the talk and uh, the paper, uh, I shrink myself as much as possible, uh, but in any case, yeah, I'll try to compensate it now by uh, in my talk. Uh, so first, uh, uh, what uh, I'm going to talk about today, uh, North Korean culture of the 80s. Uh, this is, uh, in my understanding, this is a much underestimated phenomenon because uh, when uh, people consider uh, consider this uh, on this background of uh, the other socialist cultures, uh, which underwent perestroika and pre-perestroika type of uh, reforms, uh, which actually aimed uh, some, uh, which aimed uh, some uh, uh, rework uh, and retreat from this and change of the socialist model. Uh, North Korean culture of the 80s seemed to be quite stable. 
uh, and uh, it did not have, um, uh, so nothing, uh, nothing seemed to happen there. Uh, while uh, the whole uh, nation, the, the whole world of socialist culture uh, was undergoing radical changes, uh, it seemed to stay stable. Uh, but this is very uh, wrong precision, wrong impression, because in fact, North Korean culture of the 80s, it had its own uh, unannounced cultural revolution. Uh, unannounced because it was not, uh, not comparable to what uh, they had in the other uh, in the other uh, cultures of socialist bloc, but still it's, uh, these changes were also very important. But the changes were uh, similar not to this uh, case of perestroika, but rather to uh, this case of uh, saw, uh, so or otipil, uh, saying in uh, Russian. Uh, so that was the uh, process of, uh, the, protest, uh, the process of reforms, uh, of uh, socialist culture without discarding of the ruling uh, ideology, uh, but at the same time retreat from the mobilizational, narrowly mobilizational patterns and moving toward uh, some so far unprecedented uh, relaxation and liberalization. Uh, the process which uh, uh, they experienced in the Soviet Union in 1950s, 1960s, after Stalin's time. Uh, so that was a similar kind of uh, similar kind of changes which North Korea uh, had. Uh, so uh, Alexander Dubček later described this um, described this process uh, as socialism with human face. Uh, so something which uh, aims to widen the artistic horizon of uh, socialism in order to make the system work better. Uh, and uh, some aestheticization, romanticization of uh, the communist ideas uh, and a kind of renaissance of the communist ideas in the Soviet Union. That's the process uh, which happened there. But North Korea, uh, North Korean culture in 1980s has experienced something very comparable uh, to what you see in the Soviet Union in that time. Uh, the process which uh, was denied and rejected in North Korea in 1950s, uh, North Korea, in fact, chosen instead the course of national Stalinism or sticking to this previous mobiliz uh, just strictly narrow mobilization uh, way. Uh, that's, that was uh, what happened in North Korea in 1950s and 60s. But in 1980s, uh, they seem to have its own delayed flaw. Uh, so this cultural re revolution of the 80s. And unlike the Soviet process, which happened in the Soviet Union, uh, loudly announced by uh, the Soviets, um, the Soviet policymakers. In North Korea, this process was silent. Uh, but we, of course, can have some hints on these uh, changes uh, in some speeches of Kim Jong Il, uh, who called for uh, overcoming of um, uh, overcoming uh, of um, uh, the uh, overcoming of some. Uh, strict uh, schematism uh, called for depiction of human relations and culture more humanly, uh, free way uh, to be bro uh, more broad-minded, etc. So some hints uh, show us that indeed a North Korean leader tried to uh, implement some processes in North Korean culture. But even more than that, uh, this occasional uh, occasional calls, uh, occasional speeches of, of the leader. Uh, the culture itself shows uh, the strict, uh, just this, uh, this um, uh, sh shown us the uh, wide uh, implication of this new, uh, new artistic methods and topics. Uh, if uh, briefly describe all these patterns, uh, of the early uh, 80s, which uh, North Korean culture in early and later uh, and late 80s, uh, which North Korea introduced, it was a general cooling of the militant spirit uh, of the previous um, uh, of the previous Cholima uh, like uh, culture, and overall the slower and quieter culture. A uh, sentimentalization of the conventional political topics such as biography of Kim Il Sun or Korean War, uh, and even uh, political campaigns, uh, they now were promoted through softer and more 
personal forms. Uh, this process uh, in North Korean culture led to introduction of the new people and new uh, cultural figures, uh, the most important of whom was, of course, uh, Ri chung and Kim si uh, They were the new, uh, the new cinema uh, scenario writers uh, who uh, turned uh, just upside down the whole uh, discourse before making it more sentimental and lyrical. And also they worked on this introduction of more humanistic concept of the hero. Uh, and generally it was a return from the uh, patterns of unbending uh, passionaries who had no remorse or uh, no, no remorse or doubts um, and instead introduced hidden heroes, uh, Sun and Yonun. Uh, so those uh, characters of humble self, uh, humble self uh, conscientious people, who do not expect any rewards for their selfless work for the society. Uh, and many of these characters had strong Christian allusions, uh, just with the Christian saints. Uh, especially, uh, this was really important change in North Korean culture, which was strongly anti-Christian uh, before that. Um, in many works of uh, Ri chung we see direct uh, quotation from Bible. Uh, and some uh, biblical uh, biblical comparison with uh, Bibles, a uh, citation from Bible, uh, of course, without any, uh, without, uh, you know, mention of the source, but uh, the parallels are very clear. Uh, also, uh, this uh, culture at this moment increased general uh, realism. Uh, and came closer to what actually uh, was uh, the society was actually interested in. Uh, discussion of highly topical social issues was uh, the uh, was uh, the subject uh, of uh, this new cultural works. Uh, so the characters who balance in between family and the work responsibilities, or uh, the uh, the characters uh, who. Uh, have to choose between consumption and ideological purity, some family problems, problems of socialist economy, uh, etc. Uh, also, uh, North Korean culture of this moment, of, of this uh, decade, uh, re reintroduced folklore and tradition uh, in North Korean cultural discourse. Uh, we see the renewed uh, works of classical literature, uh, who emerge as entertaining and ideological tools. Uh, you see many works uh, based on folklore and classical stories, uh, just action, cinema, and melodrama, such as Hong Gildon in Kok Chun, story of Ondal, uh, uh, of course, uh, story of Chun Hyan, and uh, etc. Et uh, this was accompanied with the increase of romantic motifs, lyrical comedies, and melodramas. Uh, important part of this discourse was a retreat from one-dimensional black and white enemy. You see more complex, uh, more uh, complex images of foreign life, uh, more images of foreign friends and repentant enemies. Uh, something which was uh, unimaginable in North Korean culture just a decade before. Uh, the enemies uh, in general, uh, even the enemies who are not going to repent, they still uh, are presented as complex uh, people, just co complex characters. And uh, also you see the emergence of counter narrative of dissenters of socialism and uh, even the motifs of uh, corruption and struggle uh, with corruption uh, in North Korean uh, works of culture. Uh, of course, this topic, I'm just talking now about the general uh, background, cultural background, but of course it's a huge, huge topic, uh, which is impossible to cover even in 30 minutes uh, speech, uh, which is uh, allowed to me now. Uh, so I would like to uh, investigate only one case uh, study or one case uh, of uh, when this, uh, which, um, was changed uh, in North Korean uh, culture in 1980s. Uh, and it was the topic of the Korean War. Uh, this change in discourse of Korean War, how it uh, was, uh, just how, how all these uh, changes of the 80s uh, just implemented, were implemented in this discourse. 
uh, why I'm choosing the Korean War? Because this is one of the most important topics uh, of North Korean uh, of North Korean culture, one of the central topic, which uh, because the mythology of the Korean War and South Korea as the separate entity uh, became cornerstone of North Korean nation building process and it never stops. Uh, it's still uh, Korean War is reconsidered constantly. It's presented in many cultural works. Uh, it's one of the most central uh, topics uh, in North Korea. Since the very beginning, uh, uh, since 1950s, uh, the Korean War, uh, the discourse of Korean War had strong Soviet cultural influence. Uh, but as we see, even the cultural influence of, of the Soviet, uh, just uh, so, Soviet cultural influence, it also has, uh, has changed too, uh, because different angles were implemented, different angles were considered. Uh, and the 80s were uh, the moment when North Korean discourse of the Korean War retreated from the militant pamphlets uh, of the past and moved toward more humanized and lyrical uh, patterns. <coughs> Just as the words about influence, cultural influence on North Korean, on Korean War in North Korea. Uh, this influence was really apparent, uh, really uh, easily palpable, uh, is, uh, just visible even at the first glance as this uh, famous poster, which call, uh, which called the uh, warriors uh, of the Red Army save us. Uh, so this is the Soviet poster of 1942, and this is the poster of North Korea. Uh, which, as you see, uh, presented uh, this, uh, the Korean people uh, also calls for Korean People's Army participation and saving uh, people uh, of Korea, peaceful people of Korea. But uh, you see the structure, the uh, general images, uh, and the slogan is ex exactly uh, the same. Uh, also, uh, many Soviet wartime uh, films and fiction, they became real blockbusters in the DPAK, and they still are. Uh, for example, one of the favorite uh, movies which North Korea really enjoy, uh, and uh, it was the novel and uh, the, uh, the fiction and the film uh, made after this novel. It's a young guard. It's a romanticized narration about life and horrid deaths uh, of the members of anti-fascist underground organization, young guards at the hands of German fascists. One of the most popular films in uh, North Korea. Uh, also, the Soviet influence on North Korean discourse was promoted through the poems of Cho Gi Chon, uh, the founding father of North Korean poetry of Soviet Korean origins, who uh, created the uh, early narrative of Korean War, in, such as in his bu uh, big poems, very well known in Korea, especially uh, Korea is fighting, Cho Sun Saunda. Uh, so he established this pattern of presentation of the Korean War as the national liberation struggle. So exactly like uh, this uh, World War II was presented in uh, the Soviet Union. Following the Soviet mode of war against Hitler, uh, Korean War was presented as victorious national liberation war against foreign aggressors, Americans, uh, it had no ideal of civil war. So South Koreans present as victims or odd and often unwilling collaborators. Uh, but one of the feature of this discourse, which uh, was extremely important in the early North Korean discourse uh, of Korean culture, it was rejection of pacifism and war phobia, as they call it. Uh, so this, uh, the themes of personal pain, of suffering, separation with the loved ones, etc., they were strictly discouraged. Uh, people who tried to challenge this uh, discourse uh, were uh, severely and quickly punished for that. Uh, typical were the uh, Im Hua and Kim Nam Chon. The campaign against them uh, began uh, immediately after uh, they uh, they made uh, they they published their works Where I Am Now, No Udi Inenya by Im Hua and Kim Nam Chon with his short story Honey in 1951. 
And it was the deadly crime uh, of pacifism because they portrayed, tried to portray war through personal feelings of people. Uh, they wrote a lot about human suffering, separation with the loved ones, etc. <laughs> Uh, the other famous victim of this campaign against war phobia was Kim Chol, uh, now famous uh, North Korean writer. Uh, the poem, which uh, extremely irritated the policymakers at the moment, it was Kung Bok Tan Chu, um, uh, a button of military uniform. Uh, so the poem narrates about the baby who has lost his mother in war, and when a soldier takes him in the arms, the baby starts to suck a button of his uniform instead of the nipple of his mother. Uh, so, and the poem uh, has the stanza, uh, sorry, my dear, I can liberate your country, your home uh, town, but I can't bring you back your mother. And the poem was rejected as too lyrical, soft, uh, and lacking political uh, meaning. Uh, so any retrieval from black and white picture of Americans uh, was considered a political crime as well. Typical was an attempt of Somanil, uh, the uh, Korean writer, uh, to rewrite a scenario of uh, Han Surya's Jackals into more uh, psychologically persuasive narration. Uh, so, but this um, uh, this motif and a little bit complicate the image of the enemy, American enemies. Uh, it was quickly uh, rejected, re rejected by the cr uh, critic uh, Kim Chan Sok. He says that in the play, Yankees are portrayed not as simple beasts, but as people who have some consciousness. This diminishes our ha hatred to the enemy. Uh, very typical reaction. Uh, and probably the most uh, radical, uh, uh, typical example of this narration were partisan movies. Uh, they were presented even harsher versions of St Soviet Stalinist film. Uh, the most typical of them were A Partisan Boy of 1951, A Partisan Maiden of 1954. Uh, so the actors who played in these films, they were stars of this time, and indeed uh, very distinguished actors such as Huang Chol, Moon Ye Bon, and the others, but it did not influence the result. Uh, the result, the works were uh, apparently beneath uh, their artistic level. Uh, so here is the, uh, the, uh, the snapshot from Moon Ye Bon uh, as the uh, partisan maiden in the film of 1951-54. Uh, so the common patterns of the partisan movie, uh, so they can be summarized by one uh, phrase which was consistently repeated in this film, there is no time for tears yet. Uh, so all the characters, uh, the heroes in this movies, they were presented in a type of fighting machines uh, who reacted with to enemies atrocities, acting very impulsively and apparently not knowing any fear at all. Uh, so, and this impulsiveness eventually leads the character to cruel death at the hands of the enemy. Uh, but uh, the reaction to this death should be revenge and no tears uh, of these fallen heroes. Uh, of course, the heroes are guided and inspired in these actions, not by some personal feelings or love, but rather by the mother party. Uh, so this is the snapshot for, from the film Our Partisan Boy, Sunyon Partisan, made in 1952. And this is the moon you born as a heroic mother of the young partisan and uh, another son, the young communist. Uh, so the enemies in this uh, film as her anti-heroes, they presented as irrational beasts who kill just for fun without any provocation and any meaning. For example, that was the uh, moment when uh, the soldier simply see the woman with the baby in, her, in his arms, he takes his pistol and shoot her. Why he's doing this, it's completely un it's completely a rational act. Why he's doing this? Uh, it's just a mother, it's a passerby on the street, but that's a typical uh, typical episode uh, in this film. All of them are physically ugly, played by Koreans, but with the big plastic nose. Uh, here, uh, this is the typical, uh, typical anti-hero. Uh, here, irrational, rude, 
physically ugly uh, and just uh, the killing machine. So of course, why North Koreans did it at the moment, it was more or less understandable because it was an attempt to dehumanize the enemy uh, and make it a very easy uh, target to destroy uh, because you won't feel any uh, any feelings to uh, the character like that you would not associ associate yourself with the uh, with such a, a, an ugly beast and of course the beast should be destroyed the relations between characters uh, in the films like that uh, they were also lack any personal warmth or any personal feelings uh, this is the episode uh, from uh, the film uh, the partisan uh, boy uh, so this is the young communist, the older son of Moon Yebon's hero and uh, heroines, and this is her uh, younger, uh, this is her younger son. Uh, so this son, the older son, he is arrested by the police, uh, uh, by, by uh, this uh, occupational forces. Uh, but uh, when he meets with her in the prison, instead of hugging his mother or trying to console her somehow, uh, the young communist instead rushes to her, and the first phrase he which he issues is, mother, I have remained loyal to the communists. That's what he says. Uh, and so when he is shot at uh, just uh, before in front of her mother's eyes, she stays completely, her face stays completely motionless. Uh, she doesn't uh, show any tears, uh, etc. So most important thing for her, that son fulfilled his uh, his duty before the party. And then the next scene uh, will be the execution of the young partisan. Uh, so the, the young boy who is playing this role, but again, he is uh, he tries to revenge his mother and his, um, you know, his older brother. He also goes to the death without any, uh, you know, without any human feelings. Uh, so this is ju just the death of three fighting machines. That's what that's what we can say about them. And the songs which were accompanied these uh, films, uh, they were also very typical. They were much like songs, very harsh. And the lyric was completely uh, in accordance with the music. They were uh, in harmony with the music. Uh, the very famous song in North Korea, the song of Young Partisan, which is very well known in uh, North Korea. Uh, the, the song of 1952, uh, which was later reintroduced in the film of 1980s as well. Uh, for North Korean cultural works, it's typical. Uh, these films are, uh, the, the songs are uh, reused many times. So let me show the song to you. Uh, so you see the song, I'm not saying that the song is bad or uh, unpopular. The song is very popular in North Korea, by the way, all kids know it uh, in school and uh, it's uh, associated with any uh, sto in, with any talks about young heroes. Uh, it's a popular song, but still the lyrics which tells about blood, uh, revenge, uh, and something associated extremely uh, only with fighting, it's a typical part of that. But in 1980s, uh, this cinema and fiction about the Korean War has changed the intonation under the influence of general liberalization and humanization of uh, the discourse. You see more images of humane people, of humane humanistic people's army, uh, sentimental images. And the typical case of this was the film Wormido. Uh, it was the example of this new cinematography about uh, Korean about Korean War. Uh, so when we do take, uh, tells, uh, narrates a tragic heroic episode of the Korean War, the battle for the island Wormido in, in June 1950, when a coastal North Korean battery unit had to hold the important piece of this territory uh, for three days against this uh, overwhelming North, uh, US forces, or everybody was killed here. Uh, but the major focus of the film, characteristically, is not the fight and scenes, but rather the motifs which were which drive the soldiers uh, during their suicidal missions. Uh, so, what actually, why they doing this? This is the focus of, of the uh, film. Uh, the film proved to be extremely popular in North Korea. 
And if we try to analyze the attractions, these attractions are mostly related to uh, this new presentation of heroism, the new presentation of the Korean War. Uh, so the characters are driven by sentimental recollections about peaceful pre-war country. Uh, so the images of the loved ones and the family members with whom they are separated now uh, is always uh, emerge uh, before them. Uh, the soldiers and the officers, they are uh, related to each other with, uh, with warm brotherly relations. They support each other as family members. And of course, the major, the uh, embodiment of this new mood uh, of the wartime film, uh, war-themed film, was the song, melodious song of the 17-year-old uh, radio operator Yungok, uh, which narrates about beauty of the countryside of Korea. The song, um, I know it now. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, it was uh, performed and played by this Yoon uh, Suyeon, uh, the uh, young actress who was the star of Wolmido, uh, extremely popular actress now in North Korea, still, uh, still uh, working uh, in North Korean cinema. Uh, but that was her debut, uh, extremely popular uh, debut here. So let me show you this song. Uh, so this, uh, uh, you see that uh, in this um, song, uh, you see uh, all this uh, film in brief, uh, in just in brief sequences, uh, what happened with the heroes, they all are killed one by one, uh, but still uh, what is important, uh, that uh, they are all connected with love, uh, with a connection, just with love, with care for each other, etc. Uh, what uh, was really interesting that um, one of the uh, typical uh, sign of uh, the liberalized, humanized, uh, humanized um, approach to this culture of war uh, begins the sequence of this uh, death. Uh, the first character to die uh, at this hands of the enemy uh, is this uh, the most peaceful character. This is the chef of. Uh, the chef uh, of this military union, a uh, very funny bubbly guy who likes to make fish and soup. Uh, so he just raving about this special soup, which he's going to uh, to cook for the commanding officer and for this little girl, uh, you know, you know, uh, and at the moment of when he was fishing, he was killed uh, by the enemy. Uh, the same is you know, she died while trying to reconnect the storm uh, the stone uh, telegraph cords, uh, and she did it with clutching her hands uh, and then died uh, as well. So she sacrificed for people. But even this smiling relations between, uh, between the softness of the characters, they uh, present as the contrast to uh, all their heroic deaths and all, all their uh, this uh, the harsh heroism which uh, they have to uh, this he harsh heroic actions which they uh, committed here. Uh, so this uh, the film uh, uh, actually laments this death of every uh, of every he hero and uh, the moment uh, which is emphasized that that everybody had something to do. Uh, at this uh, on this land, uh, so this commanding officer played by uh, Chui Chan, um, by uh, Chui Chan, so he was not able to uh, to propose to his uh, girl uh, whom he loved. Uh, so this uh, the chef he was not able to uh, meet with his only daughter and the girl you know she was not able to finish the school so everybody has something to do but uh, they had to stop their life uh, was broken by uh, by the war and by all these things and uh, the uh, interesting case uh, is the American enemy uh, so here, of course, he is the uh, anti-hero here, uh, but uh, still he is presented as the anti-hero with some consciousness. Uh, in some moments when he witnesses the relations of, of North Koreans between each other, when he witnesses these cases of um, heroism, he writes the, the farewell note to his uh, 
to America, uh, to his American friends, uh, saying that the USA can win the battle, but not the war with such a people. So uh, North Koreans are not the intruders. They are uh, protecting their land, etc. So we see uh, the character who is not probably repentant, but at least understands uh, the high uh, noble spirit of um, this uh, Korean hero, uh, heroes. In fact, this is a little bit of, uh, you know, moving from the previous, uh, from the previous uh, models of um, black and white models of, uh, of uh, the uh, just uh, of Korea, uh, American enemies. Uh, important thing to remember, however, that uh, this uh, film overall was not uh, followed the revisionist course of perestroika style art, when uh, which tried to undermine the values of previous uh, discourse, uh, and the film does not carry pacifist messages and uh, doesn't question the value, the necessity of this death, the uh, necessity of Korean War. Uh, the film, as I told you, laments the fallen heroes, but it makes the audience understand that the sacrifices are no, not in vain. Uh, the characters died protecting their, uh, their country. They fulfilled the orders before the country, and uh, we have to cherish uh, this sacrifice. Wormido uh, has, um, uh, has strong legacy on North Korean, uh, in North Korean culture. Uh, and the first uh, thing, uh, which uh, the most important probably of all legacies was the change in lyrical, uh, in the songs devoted to the army and the war. Uh, soon after Volmido, you see the uh, emergence of uh, this such classic sonnet, Tell Me About Soldiers' Love, Marhe Juri Pionsai Saranul. A very popular, very beautiful lyrical song, or the song Pretty Girl, uh, which was produced in 1989. Uh, so all the songs combined uh, the motif of self-sacrifice of the characters with soft lyricism and um, just uh, the tears over them. Uh, and more important, it was the motif of the existent uh, ex existential uh, victory of the hero over death. Uh, especially uh, typical was the song Pretty Girl, uh, the song which is uh, which narrates about the girl who uh, threw herself uh, under a tank with the grenades, but still uh, this uh, the land which she protected, uh, it's still thriving. And after her death, this uh, the birds sing, the flowers bloom, and we live happy life on, on the land protected by this by this girl. Uh, the, uh, however, what uh, can we say about uh, this, um, the change of, um, what can we say about uh, the other uh, legacies of uh, Wul Medu and uh, this, the other lyrical uh, songs um, uh, about uh, the, the, the lyrical uh, works about uh, Korean People's Army uh, victories? Uh, in 1990s, uh, the, uh, the songs were also augmented with the general, uh, the idea of liberalization, uh, melodrama, uh, and sentimental mood of the 80s. In 1990s, it was uh, aided, uh, just augmented by a general uh, positive mood. Uh, so the positive uh, cherry mood, uh, which was uh, carried by uh, which was carried by uh, the uh, new narrative of North Korea in 1980s, uh, 1990s, the narrative of the Arius March, which uh, uh, had the slogan, the, the slogan, uh, even if we go a steep way, we have to go it with smile. So the smile actually covered, uh, touched every subject of North Korean, uh, just of North Korean uh, art, uh, North Korean culture, included the uh, culture uh, related to war, related to uh, tragic uh, incidents, um, uh, etc. So the music in the songs uh, were extremely positive. So something that uh, you would never, without lyrics, if you don't 
uh, if you don't uh, hear the lyrics, you would never understand that the song is about war or something tragic and, uh, you know, sad. Uh, so the song is extremely positive and the images are extremely positive. Uh, even moreover, the films of uh, the, the films and um, uh, works of culture of 1990s and of 2000s, they uh, move toward uh, the other side. They almost completely uh, made completely disappear any tragic moments of Korean War in general. Uh, so typical in this regard is the song going to the front. So the, this going to the front, uh, the song which was performed by uh, by Moran Bond Band. Uh, and again, you would never understand without this uh, lyrics uh, that you are talking about soldiers who are going to fight and uh, apparently meeting some, at least some chances are that they will die in this, ba uh, in this battle. Uh, but the song would never give you uh, this impression. So let me show this to you. Oh, yes, that's all. <laughs> so I can, uh, this is at least you see the impression of the song. You see the uh, just things on the uh, the uh, cadres, uh, this num some snapshots from uh, from, uh, this, uh, from this video clip uh, accompanying this song. And uh, so I think it's more or less clear that uh, this, uh, this is, uh, we're talking about something very positive experience. Uh, so very positive and funny and interesting, etc. So that's how uh, this uh, this new war uh, theme songs uh, look like in Oscar uh, So this is all what I would like to say. Uh, so this is an end my, of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So shall I come in? <laughs> Yes, please, Shanting. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Liu, please take. Okay, uh, so first of all, thank you so much, Tatiana, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I am a specialist in Chinese socialist cinema. I'm not a specialist in Korean cinema. So my comment is really from an outsider's perspective. Um, so we, we all know each socialist country has its own unique historical trajectory, but some experiences do echo across the national borders within the socialist world. Uh, your presentation just reminded me how many parallels we can draw actually between North Korea culture and the Chinese culture in the 1980s, uh, because the dominant theme in Chinese cinema in the 1980s was also to search humanism. But uh, our search for humanism was motivated by uh, the party sanctioned self-reflection on the traumatic past, especially the uh, catastrophic 10 years of the Cultural Revolution. And so the filmmakers, they also adopted a melodramatic mode, poetic mode to search uh, the so-called humanity, to, re to rediscover humanity. Uh, so stories, value, humanism, humanity over collectivity, et cetera. And the, the, the films you, you showed me also remind me of the, the heavy Soviet influence on Chinese cinema, et cetera. So there are so many parallels. I'm really glad to, to hear your presentation. So my first question is really about the, um, uh, the larger motivating factor behind North Korea's general liberalization uh, in the 1980s. Oh, was that motivated by external factors, such as the changing geopolitical order in the whole world, or something coming from within? Uh, for instance, socioeconomic pressures from, uh, from the people, or uh, because uh, I think in your draft, you mentioned about uh, Kim jong ye demanded writers, artists to raise their creativity and the political insights to respond to the developing reality. So what is that developing reality? Okay, and the second question is about the lyricism. Um, so the clip you showed me, uh, you showed us, I think it's very interesting that I, I'm not sure about the electronic, maybe it's electronic uh, musical instruments in, in the background, in the soundtrack. In the 1980s, Chinese filmmakers also use that electronic instrument. It was like considered as a very modernist, modernist or very modern at the time. 
So uh, my question is really about how do you understand lyricism? Uh, of course, you show the lyrical intonation, uh, for example, the soundtrack, but how about the cinematography narrative structure? Uh, is this lyricism related to, for example, pre-modern Korean culture or traditional, you know, poetry, etc., painting? Um, yeah, so these are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, yeah, my question will be first about the reasons. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for your good reading <laughs> of my very uh, short and uh, very imperfect things which I sent to you. I'm really sorry. <laughs> yes, but still, yeah, uh, about this um, uh, external factors, uh, you, you know, the factors which actually moved, uh, just stayed behind uh, these uh, changes in 1980s. I think these factors, uh, uh, just first thing to say that we don't know for sure. So I can only guess because we don't know any, uh, all this, um, all the things were all just uh, still uh, not, uh, not declassified. Uh, so this is the thing which is close to us. Uh, so, but uh, what we can say, I think that's multi, uh, multi factors. So many factors which uh, employed, uh, just which uh, influenced this process. And when we're talking about North Korea, we can't get rid of, uh, we, can't, we can't avoid the, uh, the discussion of the personalities of the leaders. And this is really important. I, I understand that uh, the social processes, this, they are important things. They are driven by many, many factors, including economics and uh, social factors, etc. But in North Korea, when we discuss in North Korea, there's such a strictly controlled society, we can't avoid talking about uh, the personality of the leader. And I think this is the case when the personality is really important, because when we see, uh, when we look at the way how North Korean cinema and, uh, you know, the culture was led by 1950s, uh, it was uh, the person who led it, who controlled it, it was the father leader, so the first leader, Kim Jong-il, uh, Kim, Kim Il-sung, I'm sorry, Kim Il-sung. So the person who had a uh, very limited interest to art in general, but at the same time, the person who was very concerned about his, uh, you know, the safety of his leadership, because 1950s was the moment when uh, it was very unstable moment for his leadership, uh, for his supremacy in North Korea. He was, it was challenged by uh, pro-Soviet, uh, just so Soviet faction and Chinese faction in North Korean, uh, in North Korean leadership. So he was under danger. And of course, uh, all these talks about liberalization, uh, all this flow of Soviet style at the moment of uh, Eastern European style was something completely inappropriate for Kim il uh, because he, uh, not without reason, he would, uh, he considered this to be a bomb which was thrown under his, uh, you know, under, uh, would thrown under his leadership. This is one factor. Uh, he was unsafe in this moment. And the other factor is that he was the person who is quite deaf, I think, in to all this uh, cultural niceties, etc. He was not Mao Zedong and not Stalin and not uh, Kim Jong Il. Uh, he was the person who is completely senseless to such things. You know, he was not uh, artistically. He was not interested in any artistic collaboration. Uh, just uh, elaborations. Uh, so when the culture was under his control. Uh, the the writers uh, they try to avoid all these complexities, all these double meanings, uh, all these gray areas. Uh, they try to be it very straightforward, just much like style. So this clear cut way. But his son was very different. Uh, personality, just his personality. Uh, it was much more complex uh, person. So the person who first uh, he did not have the fears of his father for uh, the legacy. So his country was under his strong control at the moment. So he uh, he could be safe, uh, you know, he could be, uh, you know, completely secure uh, in his position. And on the other hand, he was the person who was extremely interested in art because we know now that if not his 
legacy of him as the son of the great leader, he would probably become very good North Korean cinema maker. He was the cinema guy who was he, he, who liked all these complexities, who loved all these double meanings. And I think that when the power over culture was in his hands, he could play, you know, it was his playground where he could do whatever he wanted. So that's why he uh, uh, so he tried to implement lots of foreign uh, foreign cultural things. We know, uh, for example, that Kim Jong Il he had huge collection of foreign movies, and that is why in War Mido and the other films made under his leadership, we see lots of foreign influences. For example, this uh, the film uh, War Mido can find lots of parallels. I, I won't specify this right now. That's one thing. And of course, the other thing was a uh, less important factor, but still uh, the fact it was, of course, the fact of external influences because the world was shaking, the world was changing uh, uh, just in this uh, moment. And uh, even Pyongyang was actually playing with the idea that probably moving toward relaxation, more of relaxation, more of liberalization would be a good idea because if we look at the Soviet Union, if we look at China, nothing wrong happens with, <laughs> with them and probably it would be a good idea here. But they didn't move it in perestroika style, uh, understandably, because it was their country. They didn't want to lose control, but they still played with the idea of some relaxation. But this process, they try to shut it a little bit or not shut completely, but try to uh, downplay it a little bit in 1990s when uh, there was the collapse of the Soviet bloc, when Kim, uh, Kim Il-sung personally witnessed uh, by, by television the execution of Nikolai Ceausescu, and he understood that liberalization would be probably have to wait for a little bit more for, for North Korean art, etc. But as we see, it was it, uh, it failed to completely uh, so this liberalization of the 80s, it never shut, was shut completely. It was, it had legacy to, uh, to, uh, to repeat uh, later, to develop in, on a little bit different uh, ground. Uh, but uh, still it was, uh, that was the fact of external, external influences. They were important, uh, important things too. About lyricism. This is really interesting thing, a very complex, very uh, difficult question which you asked me, because what is really difficult, uh, very, very different about North Korean version of lyricism in comparison to South Korean or in Korean in general, pre-liberation Korea, is very positive style of lyricism. Very positive style, what I mean by that? If you ever come, uh, if you ever read uh, contemporary South Korean novels, for example. So the first thing which we want to say, uh, just to do after reading a novel, you will go and harm yourself. I think that it's, <laughs> it's so, they're so depressing. They're so, uh, they're so awful because my first, uh, I was specializing in North Korean, in Korean literature. I graduated from uh, Yonsei University and specialized in contemporary and I, I understood that one year more and I will do something wrong with myself, you know, after all this, uh, uh, after this very, very, lots of people, uh, lots of characters commit suicide, lots of characters die of cancer, etc, etc. So it's very depressing style of, um, style of, of, uh, of uh, culture in general. And in this regards, uh, North Korean culture, actually, uh, just uh, this South Korean culture, it strictly follows the pattern of colonial literature, because the colonial literature, such as uh, Hyun Jin Gon or anybody else like that, they also are very negativist. They're very depressing style of literature. In North Korea, however, no matter what topic they touch, they, in their attitude to even saddest moments of life, they remain very positive. And why this happens like that? Uh, I would say that it's probably something to do with this Soviet uh, literature, Soviet culture, which is, uh, we tended to be more positive, or Chinese culture as well. Uh, but uh, anyway, North Korean lyricism, if, if uh, place it on this background of, um, you know, of this whole Korean culture, this is very happy lyricism. In general, it's very happy, very positive lyricism. Uh, very 
uh, even the works which are, uh, you know, which touch very deadly topics of war, of uh, illness, or something like this. Uh, so the typical is the song uh, Yepuni, the song Pretty Girl, which actually uh, playing with daddy oh the girl he went to the front she was so so pretty blah 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 blah. but then the girl go and she, she committed suicide and uh, just uh, she threw herself under tank blah 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 but we are still happy to you so even this tragic utterly tragic motif is presented in very positive style and that is why i would like to say that north korean style of lyricism is a uh, it's it's a little bit different from what we see in Korean culture in general. That's my observation. So I hope I could answer your questions. And thank <laughs> yeah, you very thank much. You. Really appreciate it. I think you've got a question. Yeah. Uh, the yes. Chat um, so we're predictably running a bit behind schedule. Um, I feel it would be unfair not to have any questions from the floor. We have one I see already in the um, Q&A here. Um, perhaps we could take this question. Are there any questions in the room? I will maybe have take one question. I see one hand up here. Would 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 you like to ask a question? Yes. yes. Yeah. And we just to emphasize, we need to do this quite quickly. Um, and and if Pro Professor Gabrusenko could answer quite quickly, that would be good. Yeah. Um, I'll just speak up. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Gabrusenko, for your presentation. Um, my question is about Soviet. Uh, representations in the um, North Korean popular culture. So, very quick question. How is Soviet Union's military support depicted in the North Korean movies that theme Korean War? Are they even mentioned or depicted in, in, in any case? Because I was reading uh, North Korea's uh, official account of external relations, which was published in 1983, I think. And they kind of obliterated the Soviet vestiges of uh, giving, providing support to the North Korea's uh, Asian founding. So I wonder if this is the case as well in the popular culture, whether you see any reference to Soviet Union or not just uh, stylistically, but in the narrative itself. Do you see actually uh, any, any mentioning of Soviet Union supporting North Korean story in the Korean War in those movies? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I hope you heard that, Professor Gabrusenko. I, I would like also yeah. just like to, if you could take at the same time the question that is, and it's it's also sort of related in a way because it's in the Q and A. Um, wait, can you see that? Mm, um, just a moment. So the question there is about uh, foreign characters portrayed uh, in um, in films. Um, can you give some examples? Did Korean actors play them? Do Russian actors ever appear in Korean films? So both questions are kind of related. So perhaps you can take them together. They're about depictions of uh, Soviet uh, role or, or depictions of Russians or other foreigners in North Korean films. Uh, you know this about, it's very big, big, big question. Again, I will try to narrow it as soon uh, as much as possible. Uh, so it depends on the time of uh, the work uh, of popular the work of popular culture, uh, because in fact, when uh, if uh, in 1950s, uh, so at the moment of Soviet era in North Korea, uh, this uh, the Soviets were referred to as um, not as participants of Koreans, uh, just of Korean war or liberation of Korea, but at least as people who. Uh, had some uh, just made some help to uh, North Koreans, uh, but uh, then uh, for political reasons, of course, when uh, this North Korea distanced from uh, from the Soviet Union, uh, so this uh, mentioning of these characters uh, it radically decreased, uh, only to be uh, but uh, again not about Korean War. Uh, in Korean War, uh, the, particip uh, the participation of the Soviets were completely downplayed, and not only the Soviets, whose uh, which role was not very not comparable to the role of Chinese, but even the Chinese uh, participants they were uh, they were downplayed uh, in North Korea, and uh, to the extent uh, to the to the extent that. Uh, it's a little bit denigrate and uh, just contempt in references to the people like that. So uh, though we know uh, we know this uh, actual role of uh, the actual role of uh, Chinese so-called volunteers in Korean War, 
uh, but uh, in North Korean literature uh, and arts and the films, uh, they were uh, just referred to uh, as um, uh, only as some helpers of Korea, assistants of Korea, uh, of Korea, not as independent, uh, not as people uh, of, uh, not as the people of independent values. So, so uh, something like Shimpurum, uh, uh, how 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 to say this? Um, so this helping boys, hand, helping hands to Koreans, and no more. Uh, as for just in the so just uh, the Soviets, they were normally related. Uh, the reference to the Soviets uh, in North Korean culture was related mostly to uh, the moments of liberation of Korea and the moments of uh, the first uh, after liberation period, uh, especially the films like Eternal Any uh, Eternal Friend. Uh, about uh, the exploit of Yakov Novichenko, who saved uh, Kim Il Sung uh, from, uh, who saved Kim Il Sung during the assassination uh, uh, attempts to assassination 1946, was extremely important. And the actor Andrei Martinov, who uh, played this role, he was extremely popular in North Korea. This uh, the role of Yakov Novichenko, but it was all related to the later period, 1980s. Uh, not 50s, not 70s, but uh, only 80s, the late 80s. In fact, in the late 80s, North Koreans produced two works, uh, two cinema, one after another, uh, relating to uh, the heroes of, uh, the Soviet heroes who died at, uh, who died or sacrificed themselves for uh, for Korea. That was Maria Tsukhanova, uh, the film from, uh, from, Five to five, I think that that's that was uh, the title of this film. Uh, so this story was completely fictionalized; had nothing to do with the real story of Maria Sukhanova, who died uh, when uh, during the uh, launch uh, of the Soviet army in Chongjin in 1945. Uh, she was presented at the film again as the helper of Koreans. Uh, as the fan of Korean uh, of Korean nations, so the person who tried to save them from uh, the bacterial uh, bacteriological weapon of Japan, so who blasted herself in order to blast uh, some den of the Japanese who tried to uh, who tried to poison Koreans with some uh, bacteriological weapon, something that never happened. And Marie Tsukanova was actually she was killed by the. She died at the hands of the Japanese when she was caught by them, captured by them in 1945. So this is a completely different story. So they made this completely different story of her. Uh, but this is uh, this is what we can say: not not Korean War, but the liberation of Korea. That's that's the historical role of uh, Soviets in North Korean uh, in North Korean films, North Korean works of art. Uh, and uh, the other very important and very big uh, question, uh, the area of question is the re representation of contemporary Russians, representations of Russians after Perestroika. And that was an extremely important uh, role uh, which they play in North Korean culture. But this is, this is another story. Uh, so I will try to keep myself short. Yeah. Uh, so that's- Thank you. That's it. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much to both of uh, both um, Professor Gabrisenko and Dr. Liu for a very interesting session. And um, I will take full responsibility for going rather over time on that session. But thank you very much again. Let's give them a.